I'd like to thank the, uh, the Institute for the, uh, the opportunity to speak with you this morning. So it's, it's my honor. I've been coming to these conferences for a long time, sitting, sitting out there. And thank you for your, your participation. Um, I think I've got a hard stop at, uh, at 10. So I've been asked to talk for 30 minutes and allow 10 minutes for questions and discussion on the, on the back end. So <clears throat> I'm going to introduce some, uh, some provoking thoughts. And so the intent really is to have a, a, a two-way dialogue for the back end. And I think that's where we'll make, make most, of our, most of our money. So 30 minutes is about right. I've discovered that uh, the longer I talk, the greater the danger of that I'll blurt out something I can't unsay later on. Um, and as keynote speaker, there's also, you're kind of in the, in the spotlight and you're kind of, all my faults are out here for all to see. So, so I'll be as, 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 uh, as, 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 uh, as brief as I can. Um, I've got a short video to kind of kick things off to kind of get us a little, uh, little focused. So two minute video um, and then we'll go into a short presentation and then, and then, and then questions and discussion. Does that work out for everybody? Okay, all right, let's, uh, let's roll the video. Okay, we all awake now? <laughs> I, get, I still get goosebumps. Uh, I've seen that a hundred times and I still get goosebumps just watching it. So, so it's all about naval engineering, uh, combat power at sea. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is I'd give you uh, this morning a, uh, a perspective. This is my perspective. It's not the position of the Navy Depart US Navy Department or Department of Defense. It's my perspective to kind of give you some thought-provoking uh, thought material that we can have a discussion on, on, the, on the back end. So. Uh, a perspective on the imperative for change. Okay? Change is difficult, change gets people a little nervous, but uh, there's an imperative for change. Uh, I'll show you what we're doing in our Navy and, and hopefully there's some similarities where you come from and there's, uh, my objective is to, perhaps there's some opportunities for collaboration amongst us, because we're all in the same business, right? So think about that and uh, my, one of my metrics for success is at the end of the conference, if I can't seem to get away because people want to talk to me, or if you want to talk to each other and exchanging business cards. So think about opportunities for collaboration. Uh, I certainly don't have a monopoly on good ideas. Uh, so I'm hoping to get some feedback so we can help solve problems together probably faster. 
So it's amazing, I'm up here looking around and most people look just like me, which is kind of interesting. Got any women in the audience here? Any? Okay, three. Wow, okay, that's interesting. Um, so you need to think about who your relief is, right? I'm going to retire at some point. I'm bringing people along with me. i got two of my folks from my staff here today. So, so think about who you're bringing along up behind you, right? Um, bring people. They don't have to be kids in school. There's people. Any, everybody's younger than you, right? Reach down and bring somebody along as your relief. Okay? Otherwise, you retire. That All that knowledge is, is lost. So think, think about that. I spend a lot of time on, on that at home, mostly in the, in the school system but also that people are right behind me that's a couple of years younger than me, right? They're, they're my protégés. So, so, so think about, think about that. <clears throat> uh, so we're an imperative for change. Um, there's a compelling need to adapt, right? The global security environment is, is pretty complex, and we're all on that global stage, right? There's nobody here that escapes that anymore, right? We're all on that global stage, and we're involved in national security, regardless of where you, where you come from, so. Um, our adversaries, uh, we view them as competitors of the competition. Okay, uh, we need to improve faster than, than they do. That's, and I think that'll become our competitive advantage, right? Improving faster than our competition, which is our adversaries. We all know who they are. Uh, the threat spectrum is is expanding, and I don't think it's about it's it's going to become any less challenging anytime soon. Uh, the world has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Just, just, just look around, just look around your, your neighborhoods, look around your nations. Dramatic change in the last in the last few years from 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 a security standpoint goes. Our competitors are gaining on us rapidly. We're starting to lose that competitive edge technologically. Okay, the competition is gaining on us. Um, some of, this, some of the processes and the approaches we use to ship design, ship construction, and actually delivering capability to the fleet is just too lethargic. It's just too slow. Okay? Um, so we really need some new ideas and some new approaches, some new thinking uh, to remain relevant. Because if you think about it, the rapid changes in, the, in, in, the, in, in technology, threats, and ship missions Right? Rapid changes in technology, threats, and ship missions. We just can't seem to keep up. So I think gone are the days of taking a warship into the yards for a year, in our case for $250 million in a midlife and refreshing the system, right? And then, uh, and then retiring the ship ahead of their service life. So the math doesn't, doesn't add up. We're on a campaign to get from about 280 ships to 355. And if we keep retiring ships off the ahead of their service life, the math doesn't add up. We just will be chasing that 355 goal for decades. May not ever get there if we, uh, we retired a destroyer after 19 years of service life because it was too expensive to modernize. Our ships are very densely packed, very expensive to design, to build, and really hard to modernize. So that, that, that business model is, is no longer sustainable, especially with the changes in technology missions and, and uh, in threats. So, Couple of slides to, to, to key in on some areas, some things we're doing to improve faster in, in our Navy, and hopefully you can benefit from that, and I'd like to get some feedback on how we might be able to do things differently and do things, to, do things together. So, so any, uh, any, uh, any media, anybody from the media here today? I know it's being filmed, so that's a, that's a good thing. Any attorneys, any lawyers in the audience? <laughs> any scientists? Any, okay, we get some scientists, all right, okay. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about science, sort of, because there's some big words in, on some of my slides, so it's uh, to, the, to the scientists in the room. Any navigators? Any former or current navigators? Okay, I kind of use a, uh, an expanding uh, great circle route here to, to kind of, so little history. Oh, we start with history, right? We start with a story, and I'm going to come in a little bit. But so in uh, 1639, my, my ancestor, Samuel Sturdivant, left Sheffield and to the, went to the New World, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, I don't think he took the, the Great Circle route. This is, uh, took a long time to get there. And, and I'm coming back here to the UK. It's great to be back. Um, he was an indentured servant to Edward Doty. He had come over a few years earlier on Mayflower. Um, but, uh, so I'm 13th generation American, but it's, it's good to be back to the, uh, to the home country. Uh, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so a little history. So in, in all deference to... Uh, uh, HMS Victory, who was uh, launched in 
32 years ahead of USS Constitution, Constitution named by our first president, George Washington, launched in 1797, uh, went into dry dock number one at Boston Navy Yard in 1833 for the first time, and then 94 years later, in 1927, which is where this photograph was taken, <clears throat> back into dry dock one at Boston Navy Yard, 94 years without a dry dock, and we used to do crazy things and tip the ship over. And, but 94 years between docking, I said, you know, try that one. <clears throat> um, the uh, oldest commissioned warship afloat, Victory is the, the, uh, the, uh, the oldest uh, commissioned warship, but the uh, but Constitution is in the water back in the United States, so there's a, a lot of good uh, history there with, the, with uh, both ourselves and the, and the Royal Navy, so a lot of history, and I'm a ship guy, so uh, my apologies to the Naval Aviation Community, the, the, uh, the Nuclear Navy and others, but I'm a ship guy. Uh, my family was in, in uh, the whaling industry for, for, uh, for many decades, um, but it's all about ships, right? And all deference to submariners and submarines are ships too, but it's it's all about it's all about ships. <clears throat> okay, next slide. <clears throat> so we're all on the global global stage, right? You can't ex escape it. I, I always show this because we know it. Uh, uh, my boss, a couple levels above me, uh, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Admiral John Richardson, he shows a slide that kind of has the Pacific in the middle, which you look at it like, hmm. So his his point when you kind of flip this around is it's all about. You know, the Pacific is where our focus has been for a couple of years in the South China Sea and the Spratly Islands and things like that. So I show the traditional one. This is the one I, I learned in, in the public school growing up. Um, but the security environment, it's, it's global, it's complex, we can't escape it. The world's a lot smaller today than it, it's been, been when, I was, uh, when I was coming up. Uh, next slide, I think I got some, some layers on top just to kind of kind of show uh, things, that, things that we're doing in, in our Navy. So we're here at about 276 ships today, 41 of which are, are deployed. Uh, next year, we're, this is all of construction. We're starting to deliver ships again, finally. And then 2021, we think we'll have about 308, and 355 is decades away if we ever get there. So that's kind of like our dear little secret is 355 is what we're ramping up to, but it's going to take a significant build plan. Can industry support that? Can the shipbuilders support it? Yes. We've asked, what about the second tier suppliers of main reduction gears and things like that? And we, we have some real issues. So that's kind of like a, the, uh, the, the weak link. Second tier suppliers to shipbuilding is, is, uh, is not where it needs to be. But if we, again, if we keep retiring ships off ahead of their design service life, we're never going to get that number. So that's the, I do the math in my head. I never do math in public, but you can, you can figure that out. Later on, so we're all you know. It's a we've been and continue to be. It's trying to trying to anticipate threats, be there, and then counter all the uh, the bad actors, the aggressors around the world, and we all know who they are. So, uh, next slide. <clears throat> so, working with our partner allies, just a couple things uh, in the last uh, last couple of months, activities around the world. Again, it's a global global force for good. So, Hawaii City. Uh, up here in the North Sea Baltic area, that general area. Uh, Ross and Porter in the Red Sea and the Med. Some recently uh, shots on, on Syria uh, and the air base there. Uh, some work here off of, off of Oman, uh, working with our, our friends in Southeast Asia and then in the, in the, uh, the South China Sea. So trying to stay forward, forward presence, power projection, uh, sea control, combat power at sea. <clears throat> okay, next slide. So a quote from uh, my boss, and I'm going to key in on a couple things here, but it's all about if you can, if you can all think about uh, improving faster. So it's all about speed, right or wrong. That's uh, that, that's how we're going to catch up. Kind of took our eye off the ball with a, a couple of ground wars in the last 16 years. So uh, we got to catch up. Our competitors are gaining. They didn't stand still. Our competitors are gaining on us. And we're about to lose that technological edge, so we gotta we gotta improve faster. And I'm gonna share with you some things we're doing at home. And uh, again, hopefully, uh, I can learn from your comments. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so a couple of things I'm gonna talk about. Uh, uh, maybe half dozen ideas, uh, and then I'm gonna key in on the last three and spend a little bit more time on, on the last three. So unmanned systems. So ten years ago, who would have thought? 
we'd have unmanned systems to the degree we do in the, uh, in the Navy. But, okay, we're still kind of organized in the three different domains, air, surface, subsurface, which gets, gets in trouble from time to time. We're trying to look at it as one environment, right? The first question you have to ask is, you know, is that air or surface or subsurface? Go talk to her, him or her. So we're trying to get away from that and just call them unmanned systems in one environment. Um, and then there's space too, right? <clears throat> um, so unmanned is our future. Um, I started this 10 years ago and every great idea started as a joke, right? Get laughed off the, off the podium. Let's see where we are today with unmanned systems. In our, our 355 ships, it doesn't include any unmanned surface vessels, so that's another advantage we can, we can provide if we can, if we can design and build them faster. <clears throat> Technology spinoff, so a couple examples. So we're on this, on this campaign on the electromagnetic magnetic rail gun, so, so key to the conference here. We still have years of developmental work for the, for the rail gun. So we spun off the high, hypervelocity projectile, right? So we're gonna field that to all five inch guns in the Navy. It's pretty significant. So we're not gonna wait years until the railgun delivers. We're gonna take that hypervelocity projectile and start fielding that to, to five inch guns across the fleet really soon. <clears throat> applications, so I used to work for a guy, Captain Rick Rushton, and he would say that the, uh, the innovation is in the application. So you can take an existing technology, you can maybe turn it 12 degrees and, and that'll solve that problem. Could you take something from a commercial industry and, and field it today and solve a problem? It's a different application. So I share an office with a gentleman from our Nav Air that works uh, unmanned systems, and he was there in the early days of uh, Scan Eagle, uh, 15 years ago or so, and we've, we've since fielded over a thousand Scan Eagles, and it's a it's a an application story. So uh, the company in situ was trying to promote Scan Eagle to the uh, the fishermen off of Alaska, go out there and see the schools of fish, and you know, go fish there. It didn't take off, but one of the, uh, the fishermen had a brother in the United States Marine Corps, told him this, took it up his chain. We, the Marine Corps bought two Scan Eagles, and kind of the rest is history. So it started, and, and the whole commercial shipping, they just evaporated. They just went, you know, their focus became military, and they, again, a thousand units later, here we are with Scan Eagles. It's, a, it's, a, it's an application story. Take it right from commercial industry, militarize it, and away we go. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great story. So you, can, you, probably have all, you probably all have three or four examples of that. Um, but think about uh, a different application for an existing thing, or maybe you could modify it and solve today's problem. <clears throat> uh, big data analytics. I think, <clears throat> I think, uh, I think uh, digitization and big data and analytics and the infusion of some artificial intelligence, I think that's the next frontier. Right, we all collect a lot of data in different pockets and stuff. We don't do a good job of predictive data analytics. How can we use that to make faster decisions? Can we put Siri on the bridge of a ship and have kind of a, kind of a shipmate advising us on some things based on behavior and trends? Why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we take advantage of all that data to help us uh, improve faster in the decision-making process? <clears throat> and we're gonna go do that. Um, nothing new here. I've been doing prototyping for 25 years. It hasn't always been rapid. Uh, but, but take things, get them wet, right? Get the feedback from, from the operators, the maintenance technicians, work that into the design, experiment with it. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, later on some things we're doing and we kind of flipped it on its ear and we're basically kind of uh, acquiring before requiring. We're going to buy stuff and then, and then formulate the operational requirement after we put it in the hands of, of sailors. Right, who knows better? The old lethargic system of 17 years from requiring and then acquiring and fielding it, that we're just turning that on its ear and speeding that process up. <clears throat> so, re, so acquiring and then requiring. Think about that. You, you may have some applications at home and would like to share some, some best practices with you on that. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit more detail about the last three, so <clears throat> some computational tools, get away from abacus and slide rules and, and, uh, and best uh, engineering judgment from a bunch of folks that look just like me. Uh, another one that started as a joke, right? We'll, we'll talk about 3D printing and ad manufacturing. Anybody have a 3D printer at home in their, in their workshop or in their public library or work with kids in robotics teams and they're, they're printing everything, right? Every year I do science fair judging and 
we're almost to a point now where the, the entire robot has been printed. Three years ago it was one or two parts. And I'll talk about putting these things at sea and envision the day where you can print on demand on a ship for a mission critical com uh, component and change that whole supply chain to a digital supply chain, right? Talk about improving faster and not waiting to catch up to that part that's gonna be delivered by FedEx in Dubai. <clears throat> and then talk about flexibility as a capability. So flexible, adaptable, upgradable, modular ships. That's our future in surface Navy in the United States Navy, and I'll, I'll talk about that, but viewing flexibility as a capability kind of changes, changes everything. And we're on, a, we're on a pretty aggressive campaign to deliver these design features in today's Navy and in the in future Navy. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the last three a little bit, and I'm gonna to try to get off the stage at early so we can have some questions and discussion. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the Goodyear story. It, it's, a, it's some independent research, so, so Goodyear, uh, American Tire Company, about 10 years ago, their, their R&D uh, department was, uh, was performing dismally. They were going out of business. Uh, so they embarked on a campaign to uh, kind of transform their design process. And uh, got hooked up with one of our national labs, Sandia, that had some pretty significant um, physics-based computational models. They were, they were building for the nuclear stockpile. You know, we don't test nuclear weapons anymore, it's all simulation based, 100%. And our president signs off once a year on the safety of stockpile because of high performance computing. Couldn't we take advantage of that national asset? Couldn't private industry take advantage of that national asset and kind of get into some simulation based engineering? Goodyear did that and within five years they reduced their cycle time by over 70%. Uh, their product delivery uh, performance went up to close to 100%. They went from delivering four new products a year to 20 products a year. And right now they're back on the, the top five tire manufacturers in the world. Uh, and they claim because, all without an increase in their R&D budget, no extra money from the boss. And they claim it was all due to, to a simulation based engineering. So an interesting story. And, and, and the United States Navy is using those same models that Sandy has built, built, built for the Department of Energy on ship design analysis. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, I think, on the next slide, so. Jeff. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so anybody, anybody familiar with what we call, what, what's called set-based design? Okay, we all kind of know point design, right? So with the use of some of these high-performance computing uh, capabilities, we've gone to a, rather than the old way of kind of a limited analysis of a couple point designs for ship design, gone to a very thorough analysis of hundreds, if not thousands, of designs of a, of a ship. And then through a process of elimination, you start eliminating the, the, uh, the outliers and then documenting that. Uh, MIT claims to have come up with this. Toyota has used this exclusively and have been very successful. So you may want to do some independent research on set-based design. Pretty basic stuff. And we're doing now, that now with our new ship design. So. Very fascinating approach. And I think if you look at it and maybe start to have some dialogue about that, it, it might change the way and the cycle time of your ship design. Why does it take so long to design ships? Take a look at set-based design. It might, uh, might help you out. We're using it now moving forward on, on our new ships. Uh, next slide. So additive manufacturing, 3D, 3D printing. I guess the story that, that I stumbled on a couple of years ago was the patents ran out. So now I could buy a 3D printer and put it in my workshop and start printing stuff because it's affordable. It was never, never affordable until a couple of years ago because the, the patents expired. Um, pretty good at using plastics. Uh, could you print parts in, in uh, aluminum, steel alloys, titanium perhaps? General Electric is doing that with some, some turbine, turbine blades and compressors and things. That they're out, uh, out ahead, I think, is one of the, the global, global leaders. Um, <clears throat> If you had one of these printers on, on ships, could you, again, could you print part? We've been doing this for decades, right? Printed circuit boards, right? That's additive manufacturing, right? As opposed to subtractive manufacturing, milling type things. But we've been doing printed circuit boards for years, so it's not really new. It's just been very expensive uh, to do. Uh, 
Uh, 3D modeling, right? Our brains are wired to think in 3D, right? So doing th more 3D models, 3D printing type stuff, it's just intuitive because that's the way our brains are. Who thinks in 2D, right? Unless you have like one eye. Um, so our brains are wired to think in 3D, so why aren't we doing more 3D type things? We have the capabilities, we just need to go invest in them. Um, so this is the reality. So the cycle times, you know, we're, we're getting new stuff from industry all the time is not, as opposed to one every 17 or 35 years. We're getting new stuff all the time. That's the reality. So how do you deal with that? We, 1990, our Navy made a decision to go into commercial available stuff, right? Cots. <clears throat> Didn't really realize at the time that the refresh rate was going to be so rapid. And how do we deal with that? We would like to buy cheap stuff, but now it's coming at us. You know, Moore's Law, it's coming at us so quickly. How do you deal with that from a configuration management? How do you take advantage of those advances? The whole lethargic system is just not adapting to that, that, uh, that business model. So, all right, next slide. <clears throat> so we fielded uh, some, some 3D printers on, uh, on several ships. The, the one that gets a little bit of press is, is one of our amphibious assault ships. Essex, so an initiative that we started on print the fleet. So I had some issues on, yeah, hey, you're in a seaway, right? You're not in my workshop at home. So it's a, it's a different environment. You don't want to print something, you know, especially if you get into mission critical components, right? You've got to be able to print the right thing if you're in, in, the, in a moving environment. So pretty good at printing, you know, plaques in the wardroom. <laughs> started there, right? Our back shells on the, uh, on the connector of the Xerox machine in the log room, we're pretty good at that, but mission critical stuff. So we, we leaped ahead and we said, what about sub-safe type stuff? What about safety of flight kind of? Let's start there and then work backwards. So we're doing that. So a couple of simple things, you know, earplugs on the flight deck. So the ship, you know, the sailors came up with that one. Why not? Start with some simple stuff. Um, but printing some, some components for uh, an assembling unmanned aerial vehicles on the, on the ship. Could you change, you know, geez, if you had a sound issue on maybe a, a, a subsurface unmanned system and you had an issue, could you just print a new propeller, right? Do you have all that data on board? Could you change that while you're on an extended deployment, perhaps? But again, it changes the whole, if you had a digital supply chain, it changes everything. You don't have to be waiting for the part or chasing the part. Or if we had, we had because of the rapid refresh on, re refresh rate on, on technology, you know, stuff is going, getting outdated. The manufacturers no longer build that stuff. Well, let's just print it. So there's some legal issues there on intellectual property and things, but just print that part that you can't get anymore or that would take several years to run a competition and best value and all that. Just, just print the part. Just print the part. <clears throat> okay, next slide. So we're pretty proud, our Navy, of a, we have a 30-year shipbuilding plan, now we have a 30-year R&D plan, but man, really? We can't wait that long for some of the stuff to pay off. You've got to be kidding me. So we're kind of thinking years as opposed to decades. Um, how do we take advantage? What's our, what's our R&D plan, and then can we use some things, some of which I've covered here today, to improve faster? It's all about speed, and I think speed is going to be our competitive advantage. So. <clears throat> This is the this is the this is the takeaway, right? Rapid changes in technologies, threats, and missions. It's just it's just challenging our lethargic acquisition ship design process that's about 250 years old. Okay. <clears throat> so we're on a pretty pretty uh, aggressive campaign to kind of change the way we design, construct, and sustain the ship. So the the problem statement is, is uh, basically we have a, perhaps it's a unique problem in the United States Navy is we're, we have a tremendous pressure from our Congress to shrink the size of ships. That whole design process we talked about, smaller ships are cheaper, right? They're cheaper than bigger ships. So get that ship as small as you can. So our DDG 51s, we, we we decrease the overhead size to make the ship smaller to fit within the budget. <clears throat> Warfighting systems are extremely complex. You cram very complex systems into very small ships and you have very densely packed ships, right? And we're surprised that the ships are very expensive to design, construct, and, and it near impossible to, to modernize because they're so densely packed. So we retire ships ahead of their design service life because it's too expensive. And there's the, there's the problem. We do it, do it to ourselves. <clears throat> so 
So starting with uh, C&O Greenert's idea of decoupling payloads from platforms, he was really thinking, I think, decoupling the development cycle from the ship and separate from the actual payloads, the combat systems, the mission systems, so decoupling the development cycle. So in the case of LCS, the ship is kind of waiting on the mission packages, so that we screwed up there. <clears throat> this is being filmed. Can I strike that from the record? <laughs> But the theory makes sense. You decouple. So for years, you know, we tightly coupled the weapon systems, the mission systems, to the ship hull. <clears throat> and then we realize it's really expensive to, to try to take those things off and replace them. And now we're replacing the, you know, the, the five-inch gun, the Sea Whiz, the Sea Ram, the rail gun, the Mad Fires. Uh, we just can't do that unless we think ahead and have common interface standards, right? We all know this stuff. And I think some of our NATO allies are way ahead of our Navy on, on the modularity and the common interface standards. Pre-planned access routes, right? Reconfigurability in the decks so you can move stuff in and out quickly and, and efficiently. Uh, we're trying to get away from ripping out to swapping out. I keep things simple so my staff understands what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So try to get rid of hot work through modernization. Can you just change the furniture inside the space? Change the a weapon system at a topside weapon station. Minimize hot work, cutting, burning, that sort of things that drive schedule and cost. So. <clears throat> and then where we really, really don't do a good job is the last one here, allowance margins for modernization. So the ships are through design, so trades off, we're always kind of delivering the ship with very little reservation for uh, weight, and kg, electrical power growth, cooling, network bandwidth, right? We deliver the ship and then we're surprised that we can't modernized because we don't have enough growth margin left in this ship. We kind of do it to ourselves. So three or four years of some deep dives working with the Danes and their Stanflex concept. We're going over to Germany on Wednesday to do a deep dive on the, the German uh, Mako concept. We're going to meet with the Dutch. I'd like to talk to the folks in the Netherlands here about your Sigma concept. But uh, we're all in. This is our new ship design. This will be in these five Design elements will be in an operational requirement for our new future surface combatant. And then there's some benefits that I really can't have trouble quantifying in our business case, but we all know that they're, they're there. So easier to build. The shipbuilders tell us they can build ships more affordably this way. We know in our heart of hearts we can modernize the ships easier, more efficiently, and, and cost effectively this way. And then there's a bunch of added benefits. So in addition to distributed lethality and pacing the threat by taking off a CWIS and putting a CRAM on. We, we can do that with all the money and people in the world, the kind of John Wayne stuff, but is, can you do that with some forethought about thinking ahead and make it, making it easy to swap out systems on the ships? So I'd like to get some feedback on our approach because we're all in here and we gotta get it right. Okay, I think that might be my last slide. And that's the end? And uh, I, think, I think we have some time for uh, some, uh, some discussions, uh, which is, I think is where we're going to make our money, so. <clears throat> Let me go and thank you. Um, uh, right, uh, we're going to go into, uh, we've got, I think, five minutes or so for, for questions for Glenn. Uh, we've got a microphone, a roving microphone, which will uh, be provided. If you've got a question, please wait for the microphone to come to you before you speak, and please use the microphone, and then, then pass it back quickly. So, any questions? Rinsen Geerts, my Royal Netherlands Navy and Delft University of Technology. Um, it strikes me, you're, you're telling us you're really looking towards modular systems, but the, the recent programs that we all know about, the, the Zumwalt and the LCS, seem to be uh, platforms that are extremely powerful by themselves, but because of that, extremely, uh, extremely complex. And LCS, really fast, so there's, everything is probably about getting the power for propulsion, and, and Zumwalt is a fully integrated uh, mission system, and I think there's probably not that much mod modularity left to it. On the other hand, you, you also show that there's a lot of unmanned systems coming in, and I wonder whether or not the answer is that actually the unmanned systems should provide the modularity, and the ship should be as simple as possible and maybe not have that much capability by itself. And, and still, you seem to be going the other way. What's your view on that? Yeah, good, good question. So. Mm -hmm. Change is, a, uh, change is a slow process, 
And what I'd like to do is, as much as I, 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 I can't, snap my fingers and say, tomorrow all of our ships will be, will be flexible. Uh, so we have limited success on the existing fleet, the existing shipbuilding programs, where all of those five design elements were going to uh, make a difference is future, future ship design. So, so modularity, I think, is, is a piece of flexibility. Uh, I think Zumwalt uh, got it right when we talk about you know, 78 megawatts of electrical power. We have plenty of power for the next 35 years. We got, we got that one right. We have enough space and weight on Zumwalt to add capabilities for 35 years. We got that one right. Uh, we have some flexible infrastructure in the deck on, on a couple of compartments on, on the first ship. So we're starting to implement those things through contract changes, which is a for the cost overruns we saw in Zumwalt, it's very difficult to introduce change. Uh, so that's just kind of like the, the environment we find, our, find ourselves in. I think we got the modularity right with LCS, but we're, the ship is kind of waiting on the modules right now. So that's, uh, that requires some significant uh, improvement. Uh, so we're, looking, we're making strides on all of those design features of, of flexibility, not just the modularity piece, uh, to kind of implement this new thought process so the ships are actually designed for modernization and can be upgraded. So we, I think we got it right with space and, and weight, electrical power. Uh, we have some, some uh, rapid access routes and some flexible infrastructure. There's not a lot of modularity. I agree with you that the, uh, if you, uh, the unmanned systems, when you bring fire scout, Scan Eagle to the ship in the case of unmanned aerial systems, they come with the Connex box, they come with the modules that have the parts and the, and the, the people. So uh, I think that's, that's an approach on, on letting the unmanned systems bring modularity to the ships to add capability. So, so I'm not sure if I answered your question, but it's a complex thing. Modularity is, we view that as a piece of flexible, adaptable, upgraded ships, upgradable ships. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. <coughs> Any more questions? Okay. I think noting the time, I think we will we will draw stumps there. Glenn, thank you for, okay. for the keynote. Uh, if you'll join me in showing your appreciation. Mm -hmm.